Hey directors, it is week three and so we are talking about comparisons and the first thing that I do to start off class is try to warm up the kids brains by doing a little bit of number knockout and I mentioned I think on the first week I actually will put up on the board the number knockout board and then I have a little smaller version of it where I circle a couple of um, battleships so I do a little two number ship and a three number ship and a four number ship and so then as the kids um, we roll the dice we have our three numbers let's say it's two five and one and they have to do their calculations and then shout out to me how they solved a number on the board with the calculations. I cross it off and I let them know if it's a hit or a miss and they're trying to hit all the ships. And so usually I set, um, I always set a timer for five minutes and usually they could get that to where they at least hit the ships in those five minutes. Although sometimes if one is one of your numbers, they can't always get to it. So we do that the first five minutes. And then the next thing that I do is, um, just kind of pull out the math map kind of compass page here and remind them where are we this week. So we are still in the domain of complex numbers and then we are in 1D. This is our first week in one dimension on week three here and we still have a little check mark checked on here. So they can see that so that they're always tracking where we're at. And then um, uh, just a little reminder that one dimension is linear space. And so um, in 0D, we talked about a point, which you could use the point of your finger to represent. And then for 1D, you could do a line or you could do it like this, where you're drawing out a line, just a straight line, infinite length. So the next thing we do is go onto our cover. And so the cover, you can look at it. Um, the artwork is called Justice by Nicholas de Bern. And I always say, what do you see? And I let the kids just start talking and discussing what they're seeing in here. Um, some of them might notice that they're looking at judgment and, um, or justice, sorry, justice. And it actually does say that this piece is called Justice from the Cardinal Virtues by Nicholas de Bern. Uh, de Bern. And um, so they might notice that she has scales in her hands because, um, Justice would be um, looking at things for the scale of right or wrong. Um, you see that a lot in law. And then um, the blindfold that she's wearing is to blind her from making any sort of judgment to make sure she's impartial and she's not discriminating based on appearance or status or anything else. And then the sword is representing that she upholds justice. Um, there's apparently some other things. I think I probably read it from the contribution or I might have looked up some information about this. Um, but apparently um, peacocks, there's a pe oh, there's some peacocks down on the bottom. And peacocks can represent pride or vanity because they're so beautiful. Um, so that could, would be a negative thing maybe. But the owl represents wisdom, which would be a positive thing. So you're seeing a lot of these different items. Uh, this type of artwork... Um, I asked the students, does anybody know what this type of artwork is? It doesn't look like it was drawn or colored. Um, doesn't look like it's, you know, pastels or paints. It's actually a printmaking piece. And I had a printmaking piece because we had some artwork and I was able to pass that around class if you happen to have one. Um, but if you don't, pretty much you can just explain that either wood or metal was carved into to make an image of something. And then they lay down the paper and they press it with the, or they roll it with the ink. And then they lay down the paper and press and make an impression of it. And so this piece of paper is a printmaking, kind of like you would have even with the newspapers um, early on. So uh, art in engraving is what they use for printmaking. And then justice is one of the four core moral virtues. And so the other ones are prudence, fortitude, and temperance. And Byrne apparently created this during a political upheaval in the Netherlands. And so it's meant to be a political statement, uh, this piece. And then we read through the quote. So we have a quote on here. And um, the contribution just mentioned, and I liked this part of the contribution. It said, I must seek perfection rather than be perfect myself. My duty lies in the choice to do that which is virtuous and useful for the future life. And so you can talk more to the students about that and, and what that means. And then there's the reflection and you can read through that and it kind of mentions how the Holy Spirit can bring understanding 
be willing to receive help so that the teacher or Jesus's labors are not in vain. And then um, see if the kids recognize the name of the speaker, John Calvin. And they might remember Calvin's Institute of the Christian Religion, um, Council of Trent. So you kind of sing along the timeline song and see if they are kind of putting those pegs together of where, what time this is in history, where we're getting John Calvin and he's, he's bringing us this quote. And then any other thoughts that they have on this, let them add any other thoughts they have to this. Then we move on to dialectic stage for about the next 20 minutes. And so we're looking at our invention page and asking, um, what do you know about one dimension? And so you can just open-ended, ask the question, see if they have any feedback or if they see things that are familiar or they, they recognize and let them talk for a little bit. If they're being kind of shy and quiet, then bring out the five common topics and kind of get their brains um, thinking about some of this. So of the five common topics, so the first one we'll talk about is compare. And you can compare kind of the line pieces or the, the naming for the line parts. So the difference between a line and array and a segment, um, the endpoints on it. Uh, so kind of comparing those. For definition, um, they mentioned to define vectors. And so you can see there is, um, it is showing vector on here. And so just mentioning that vector is both the magnitude, which is the size and direction. And um, that's how you notate vectors. And then circumstance, um, the comparison they made for circumstance is the real number line. You see the real number line on here. And so when it's horizontal, we're talking about the real number line. In some of their problems, they're going to see vertical lines and the vertical line is representing the imaginary number line because in 1D, they don't overlap. So you have your real number line is the horizontal and the vertical line is going to be your imaginary. And when we get to 2D, they're going to interact and overlap at zero but for now they're separated and they'll be separated in their student problems. Uh, for um, relationship of things uh, lead to order on the number line. And I think what she's getting at for that is inequality and equality. So when things are greater than or less than, and you can give some examples of how you would see that, um, you know, if you had a line and you're looking at, um, you know, X is greater than or equal to one. And so you're talking about point one and you're saying it's equal to or greater than. So equal to means it's closed. Um, it's inclusive of that. And then you head off because X is going to be greater. So it'll move off in that direction. And they have a lot of examples of that in their student pages that they can practice. And then the last five of the five common topics that you could choose to talk about are um, authority and how zero is really an authority or zero is the origin and so it's the authority for a lot of numbers. Okay, so the next thing is the memoria and arrangement page. And so um, a lot of times the memorial arrangement, we're just attending to it. We're not trying to memorize everything on these pages. So you can just mention how we're talking about scientific notation and you can notice some things about the numbers and how you would convert from one to the other. And then down here you have the prefixes for a bunch of numbers. And this is kind of fun to look at. So as you have the exponent, so 10 with an exponent of one is deca, 10 with the exponent of two hecto, 10 with the exponent of three kilo, and that's at a thousand. So as the exponents go up and higher, you're getting to a bigger number. But as the exponents are a larger negative number, so negative one, negative two, negative three, you're getting a smaller and smaller micro amount um, that's closer and closer to zero because it's after the point of the decimal. So just something for them to kind of notice on here. Um, you can also notice that when 10 has an exponent of two, how many zeros do you have in the answer? You have two. When 10 has an exponent of six, how many zeros do you have in the number? Six zeros, and that's our millions. Um, when 10 has an exponent of 100, how many zeros do you have? You have 100 zeros, and that actually has a name, and it's called uh, Google which I'm sure is where Google got its name from, <laughs> but I don't know that, absolutely. 
Um, the next thing to mention is that this page also has um, some discussion on significant digits. And so when we're thinking about what is significant on that digit amount, you're counting all of the non-zero digits. So anything that doesn't have a zero on the number, you're counting um, anything that's between those non-zero numbers. And then anything that trails after the decimal point counts because anything that is less than zero, this is more and more specific. So those numbers all matter. And then you don't need to count other zeros. So for example, I give the example um, zero, zero, five, zero, eight, zero, point two, zero. And so how many significant digits are there in here? Using those rules, look on your sheet and see what it says. And so from this, they would notice that we care about everything that's after the decimal point. So both of those matter. And then we care about the ones that are a number that is not zero. And we care about anything between those numbers that are not zero. And so we have one, two, three, four, five, six significant digits in this number. And so that's just a little practice to let them see that. You can also see how you can um, convert from scientific to standard on here. And then uh, another thing on conversion, and this might matter more as we talk about the charts, is that you always have to talk in like terms when you're wanting to compare two different things. So I can't add two apples and three oranges and then think that changes my apples. We have to convert and think about them as fruit. Um, although maybe that example is more confusing. I'll do an example with actual math that will help. So my friend wants to run a 5K race. So five kilometer race. And she's like, come on, Amber, join me on this 5K race. But I don't think in terms of kilometers because I'm American, right? So I think in terms of miles. And I'm saying, how many miles is that before I sign up for this race? So I need to decide that. So we need to convert it. So we have five kilometers. And to convert, we need to multiply it by um, something that just has the units but still has just the value of one. And I love in MathMap how they put this little green box around things to show that our fractional amount inside of here is equivalent to one. So inside of the fraction, I, I want, here this is like saying five over one. I want kilometers in the bottom. And so I can check my little chart and see that one kilometer is equivalent to about 0.621 miles. And so 0.621 miles is equivalent to one kilometer. So this is just going to simplify out to be one. So I'm just saying five times one, I'm not changing any, by, by multiplying by one, I'm not changing anything on the values. All I'm doing is helping to get the units down. So at this point, we can say, cross out our kilometers because one is up on the numerator and one is down in the denominator. So as I multiply across, those cancel out. And so now I'm just multiplying my five times 0.621 and my one times one for the denominator. So one times one is just one. And then the five times 0.621 is 3.11. And my only, only unit left is miles. So my answer is 3.11 miles. And I guess I can run 3.11 miles. So yes, I'll sign up for that 5K. I think I can do it. So that's just a little reminder on how to do conversion. Fortunately, on a lot of their math map, they're given the thing that they're calculating with to do the conversion. And so then they're just kind of trying to um, do their, cross out their units and do their multiplication across. So it'll help them kind of practice that skill. And then, um, I go through aha moments for the last week if they have anything they wanna share or ask. And then we go through the tops of pages one through four. Um, page one, oh, page one is right here. Yeah, so we just work through the top and have them work through talking about number lines and then um, they're doing some other stuff with um, finding midpoints and uh, and then they do some stuff with um, 
uh, inequalities and then temperatures. So we don't really talk about temperatures in class, but they can use their charts to work through that. So this week, uh, there's a lot of info, but maybe some of it's familiar and the charts have everything they, they need to try to solve those items. So hopefully this was helpful. I realize this one was a little bit shorter than some of the others, um, kind of running through it quickly, but uh, hopefully that helps you out. And I'll put the lessons plans down in the description and so that you can link to that and there's a little bit more detail in the lesson plan. Thanks for watching.